following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Cain and Abel, uh, number five lecture. This uh, topic, indeed, is very deep since uh, it is also related with alchemy. The word alchemy comes from alchemy of Allah, <coughs> since alchemy indeed is a, a Arabic uh, science that was uh, known very uh, much in the Middle Ages. And of course, as you know, Egyptians were alchemists. It's a very ancient science. And uh, uh, Moses learned alchemy in Egypt. So therefore, the book of Genesis, which we always quote, is a book of alchemy. All of it. And uh, as we explained in many lectures, the mystery of Adam and Eve, <coughs> Cain and Abel, is really an alchemical mystery given to initiates, meaning to those uh, neophytes that were interested into uh, psychological transformation and physiological transformation by means of the science of alchemy. Unfortunately, uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis and the whole Bible was spread all over the world without teaching the meaning of the myth written in its pages. And that's why now we explain the myth or Hebrew mythology in order for us to understand uh, the meaning of all of these uh, mysteries. <coughs> As you remember, Adam and Eve are two archetypes that can be developed in each one of us and refer to many uh, elements that we have physically and psychologically. Physically, of course, we always state that Adam refers to the central nervous system 
which is the brain and the spinal medulla. We have stated that the brain and the spinal medulla is uh, floating in what is called the cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid is that water, superior water, that the book of Genesis called Shamayim. <coughs> the word Mayim means water, and the letter Shin is fire. So when you say Shamayim, you are implying a uh, fiery water. And indeed, uh, all of us have that uh, fiery water in the fluid that sustain the brain and the medulla. But we also stated that our physical organism has another fluid which is located in the prostate in the man and in the uterus in the woman. That other fluid, the sexual fluid, the passive, because a positive sexual fluid is that cerebral spinal fluid in the central nervous system. So Eve, or as it is written in Hebrew, Hava, is precisely that fluid <coughs> that we have in our sexual organs. So therefore, when we talk about Adam and Eve, we are talking about these two fluids, or two systems that everybody has in their body. That's the main thing. That's why the word uh, Adam in Hebrew is written with three letters. The first is Aleph, no, the letter A in English, which is the symbol of air. And that's why that is the first letter, because really the air of Aleph is a breath of life from God that all of us have that enters through the nostrils and that's why uh, Aleph is in the head the air without the air we cannot be alive now if you visualize the fetus in its first uh, weeks of life, you see that uh, it has a shape of an horizontal line and a vertical line. The horizontal on top is the brain, and the vertical is the spinal medulla, the spine. That in Hebrew makes the shape of the letter Dalet. The letter Dalet or the word Adam refers <coughs> to the physicality that begins with the shape of that fetus. Because the letter Dalet has that shape in Hebrew. Horizontal line and a vertical line. Of course, that fetus develops to the body that we have right now. That's why when we talk about the letter Dalet, we are pointing at the physical body. Whether it is male or female. And the last letter of the word Adam is letter Mem, because in Hebrew you don't write with vowels, just consonants. So three letters, and I'm going to write Adam. 
And the letter mem or m in English symbolizes water. <coughs> so in synthesis, the word Adam refers to the air, the physical body, and to the liquids, the water that is contained within the body. Remember that it is stated that more or less the physical body is like 70% liquid. So that is Adam, physically speaking. But this mem is always related with the waters that in the tree of life relates to Yesod and to Da'at, which is that Sephira beneath the first triangle of the tree of life that we always study in relation with Genesis. The tree of life, as you know, is formed by the ten sephira, sephiroth, or spheres. And in the middle is a mysterious sephira dat, which means knowledge. So, the word Adam, or the mem, or the word Adam, refers to these two liquids. The cerebral spinal fluid and the sexual fluid in the prostate <coughs> or uterus. So therefore, in itself, Adam is an androgynous entity. Andros is a word in Greek which means man. And genica is a, a Greek word which means woman. So when we say androgynous, means male-female. And if you observe the body, really, is male-female. The male aspect or the positive aspect of that uh, sexual force is located in the cerebral spinal fluid, while the feminine aspect is in the sexual organs. Whether it's a man or a woman. So when we refer to the sexual organ, we say she or it, but refers to a feminine aspect. When we refer to the brain, it's he, it's Adam. But uh, as you observe the development of the fetus, in the womb of the mother, in the beginning, you don't realize if that is going to be a male or a female. Little by little, in its evolution, the development of that fetus, sex is appearing. <coughs> so the first thing that you see is the brain and the medulla of that Dalet of Adam. But that Chava or Eve, which is the sexual organ, appears later in the evolution of that fetus. In this way, the womb uh, of any woman recapitulates or repeats former planetary or cosmic events of evolution of the race. In this case, we state that in the Lemurian continent, <coughs> in the times of yore, thousands of years ago, existed a humanity who were androgynous, and we talk about that. They were male-female in each body. But with time, they were divided in sexes. And the proof of that is in the womb of the mother, where the first thing that we see is a fetus, 
which we cannot say if it's male or female. But with time, we see that the sexual organ appears as uh, development of that uh, uh, archetype, we will say, physical archetype <coughs> or model, which is the sperm in the oven. So if we analyze this, we see that really the sexual organ and all the different uh, parts of the body emerge from that marvelous cerebrum spinal fluid, brain and the spinal medulla, little by little. So is what the Bible says, that from Adam emerged Eve. But we had to look at this from this point of view. Eve, indeed, is a sexual organ that is emerging from that Adam, which is androgynous. That happened, of course, in the past, through evolution. But as I repeat, uh, we, uh, the woman recapitulates in the womb all that process in order for us to learn. So that's why when the sexes were divided, and then the male was also called Adam, and the female was called Eve. And that's why the symbol of Adam and Eve also applies to the two sexes. The male is Adam, and the female is Eve. But individually speaking, our brain is Adam, and my, uh, our sex is Eve. And that's precisely the deep meaning of this. Now, if we take the symbol of the tree of life, when we name Adam, we name the six sephiroth beneath the first triangle. Named Chesed, Geburah, Tifereth, Netzah, Hod, Yesod. In the book of Sohar, they call it Seir Amping, which is Adam. But this is the Adam, the psychological. Adam, the spirit, that which is inside, not physical. And the last sephira, which is here, which is called Malkut, is a physical body. And that is called Chava, Eve. <coughs> you see? So also when we talk about Adam and Eve, I said, Adam, my spirit. Eve, my physical body. So... When you read the Bible, and you don't know in which way is the Bible talking to these two archetypes, you get lost. Because they go further inside, psychologically speaking, spiritually speaking. And we, are, we are touching just the basis of this. So therefore, uh, Cain and Abel, the two children of Adam and Eve, obviously, refer to other developments inside of us in each aspect of Adam and Eve. So that's why we, the Gnostics, when we refer to Cain and Abel, or Adam and Eve, we talk in different levels, different ways. And we need to know, or to have, in other words, a lot of intuition, in order not to get lost Otherwise, you don't understand uh, the myth. Because the myth is like a coffer that envelops a lot of truths that we need to uncover. And everything is hidden in the letters, Hebrew letters. But we explain already because we give 22 lectures related with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
So therefore, when we read the Bible, we also have to know the meaning of the letters in order to know the aspects of this alchemical work, which is called Genesis. <coughs> As we said in the last lecture, Cain, the word itself, means nest. And Abel, the word itself, means breath. And that has to apply, to be applied, to our own physicality, to our own psychology. We also stated that the Sethians, those who follow the wisdom related with the third son of Adam and Eve, who is Seth, those people, the Sethians, stated that the sun, with its radiations, make a nest inside of us. Nest is Cain. And that constitutes the serpent. Well, an Abel is a breath of another serpent. Remember that we have a breath, the breath of life inside of us. So these are the two polarities in alchemy, Cain and Abel, in different levels. But we had to learn. And everything is inside of us. <coughs> Obviously, this Cain and Abel, and all what is written in Genesis, also point at the evolution of the races of this planet. But we talk about that in other lectures. Now we are entering directly into our own physicality and psychology. In order for us to understand that the book of Genesis is a guidance to those that want to work in a transformation. Because that is alchemy. The chemistry of Allah. Allah is God in Hebrew. I mean in, in Arabic. Because in Hebrew, uh, God is El. It's similar. If you said Allah, and then is goddess in Hebrew, while in Arabic is God. As in Spanish, God is Dios. Latin, de Deus, Dieu. In, in French. So, alchemy is the chemistry of Allah. In other words, the transformation of all of these archetypes and forces that we have within in order to make of us a human being into the image of God. <coughs> With this, we are stating that we are not human beings. We have the shape, physical shape. But psychologically speaking, alchemically speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not human beings. We can't be if we work. So let us place that statement very clear because we uh, disagree with all these conventional sects or religions that state that all of this planet is populated by human beings. No. Humanoids. They have a shape of a human being. But we know the human being. That's why we stay there. They have the same shape that we have, but internally it's different. So, when we talk about the serpent comes into our mind, the Hebrew word for it. <coughs> uh, 
Nahash. This is how you say in Hebrew. You write from the right to the left. Nahash. And from that Nahash comes from the Nahashenians, or what they call the Nathanians. <coughs> uh, ancient uh, Gnostic that existed in the past, Gnostic group, the Nathanians, grown from Nahash which in Greek were called Ophites, Ophites as well. From Ophit, which in Greek means serpent. So the Ophites, Ophites, and Athenians are those that were worshipping the serpent. Now, when we talk about the serpent, we have to understand that there are three serpents that we refer to. Due to the fact that, that the fire or the energy that circulates in an organism does it in a serpentine manner. That serpentine manner, of course, is what the Bible talks about, and not only the Bible, but other books of other religions. But we are referring just to Genesis, because Genesis talks about the serpent. And we said that Cain is that nest that the sun makes with its radiation in our physicality, and that constitutes the serpent. But in order to understand this mystery of the serpent, we have to go into the caduceus of Mercury. The caduceus of Mercury possesses two serpents around the caduceus. In ancient times, the central, the caduceus, was another serpent. And of course, that uh, was making the shape of the letter Shin in Hebrew, which is always with three wicks. Letter Shin. And that's why the word Nahash ends with Shin. Nahash, and that is the symbol of fire. So when we name the letter Shin, it's fire. Now, when we talk about fire, we talk about two polarities. The masculine fire and the feminine fire. In Hebrew, fire is written with two letters. The letter Aleph, which symbolizes air, and the letter Shin, that symbolizes fire. They said Esh, that's fire. But if you place the letter Yod, or the holy name of God, yod He, vav He, that we always name here, the letter Yod, which symbolizes the brain, And then you said ish. So it is pointing to that fire which is in the cerebral spinal fluid. And ish in Hebrew means man, masculine. But if you want to name the feminine fire located in the sexual organ, which is always symbolized by the letter He, of Yod He, Bav He, the second name of God. Then you write again the name fire, Aleph, Shin, 
and put at the end the letter He. And you r read it, Isha, which is translated in Hebrew as woman. But it is the feminine aspect. The first one, fire, contains the men. The second one, fire, contain, contains the woman, the hay. So when we talk about male fire and female fire, we are talking about Ish and Isha, alchemically speaking. And that's why in Hebrew, Adam is translated as men, but Ish as well as men, and Isha as woman. If you don't know that, when you make a translation of the Bible into English, you translate as man and woman, but really implies the male and female aspect of the fire. It's an alchemical statement. And how are the translators to, to write that? Oh, this is a man, but of the fire? Because what is translating, it doesn't say that. It just said ish, isha, this is it. But only those that know alchemy know what they're reading. Now you get that all the translations of the Bible really are not accurate. But you don't know the mysteries. <coughs> now, there's another mystery here. Very simple. That only when you know these uh, basic elements, you see it clearly. Otherwise, you don't. The man in the book of Genesis was created in the sixth day. You read the book of Genesis. And the sixth day is when Elohim said, Let us create the man into our own image, according to our own likeness. And he created them male, female, androgynous, as I will explain. Sixth day. Now, when we study the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, what is the sixth letter? The sixth letter is the letter Vav, which is here, simple, a vertical line, Vav. And that we always stated relates to the spinal medulla. <coughs> so when we said the brain and the spinal medulla, we said Yod Vav. Because when we name the, God, the name of God, which is Yod, He, Vav, He, and that is translated as Jehovah, we said Yod is the phallus, He is the uterus, Vav is the man. He is the woman. That is the meaning of the four letters of the name of God, which is translated as Jehovah. It's an androgynous name that, that contains the two polarities, above and below, alchemically speaking. But if you don't know alchemy, you, you get lost. That's why Yod is phallus, He is uterus, Vav is a man, and he is the woman. So when we take the two male parts of that name, which is Yod and Vav, then we form the brain and the medulla. And that's why they said that the letter Dalet is a Yod and a Vav together. The union of two letters. To form what we have, the central nervous system. But so then, when we refer to the man, Kabbalistically speaking, we refer to the letter Vav, always. When we say the man, the Vav, the letter Vav, the six. Why? Well, because it's a six letter, because the man was created in the sixth day. It's very clear there. Of course, this implies other mysteries, but simply that. And the woman? What letter is the woman? Well, the woman is the letter Zayin, which is similar. 
If you see, the letter Zayin is another vertical line with another Yod on top. The difference is that the vertical line descends in the right side of the letter Vav, while the vertical line descends in the middle of the letter Zayin. That's the only difference. When you see the Hebrew letters, you have to be very careful not to mistake the letter Vav for the letter Zayin. And the letter Zayin is the seventh letter. Vav is six, seven is Zayin. <coughs> well, when was the woman created? If you read the Bible, was created in the seventh day. Simple. So the woman is the seventh. So when you put these two letters together, you join them. And then you make another letter, which is called Het. That letter Het is like this. The union of Vav and Zayin. And that letter means life. Alchemically, it's very simple. Of course, the union of the two letters, man and woman, make life. And that's why the word life in Hebrew is written with a hat and the letter Yod. The letter Yod is on top of the letter Zayin and on top of the letter Vav. Both male females have it. So this is what is life or live, live, life in Hebrew. So behold that. So when you say in life, you are uniting two forces. Not only outside physically, but also internally. Because the letter Vav and the letter Zayin are the two serpents of the caduceus of Mercury, which entwined in the spinal column of everybody. So, the serpent of the right of the caduce of Mercury is the Vav. And it's called Gud. Tov in Hebrew. And the letter Zayin is the left serpent of the caduce of Mercury. And it's called Evil. Ra in Hebrew. But... This word, good and evil, is really <coughs> very uh, uh, vicious words that everybody uses in their own way. Better to call pure and impure, or right and wrong, inside of us, whether we are a male or a female. And remember, that we said that the physical body is the female aspect of our spirit. So when we talk about the spirit, it's a positive, and the physical body, the negative. So in other words, we physically are negative, evil. Simple. And here you see the different aspects, symbols. Now the explanation is why. And the, in the Bible is hidden all the mystery. This graphic that we always place there in order to teach you the 10 Sephiroth is called the tree of life. But really, the right translation should be the tree of living or oh, lives, plural as well. How do you write living or lives? 
or what the Bible translates life, but it's a wrong translation. Living, the letter het, the letter yod twice, which implies, of course, the two yods, the man and the woman, and the letter mem at the end. Chaim, living. And that implies the right side of the tree of life. Because the letter Mem always ends in the Sephira Yesod, which is mean foundation, ends in the sexual organs. The waters that we have in the sexual organs are precisely the source of life. Chaim. So when we talk about the tree of life, we talk about all the forces which are inside in other dimensions that comes from the waters of life, the sexual waters that men and women have in themselves, in their own chaim. So the tree of life ought chaim is precisely the brain and the spinal medulla. Because the mem ends always in Yasad. That's why Jesus of Nazareth said in the Bible, God is the God of the living. God is the God from Yasod up to the other Sephiroth. Because in Malkut, they are not the living. It's easy to see. <coughs> when you know that the letter Mem ends in Yesod, it doesn't go further. Whether it is final Mem. If you study the Hebrew alphabet, you will know that there are five letters that is called final. That you write at the end of any word. The letter Mem is one of them. But the letter Mem is a square in the end. While the other letters, which are called final, they go down into Klippoth, straight line. Yeah. The letter Nun, for instance, is made like this. Hmm? Two little horizontal lines and one vertical united. But when you write final Nun, you write only one vertical and one, uh, one horizontal and one vertical down to Klippoth, which is hell in the tree of life. Likewise with the other letters. The other three finals, <coughs> except the letter Mem, doesn't go down because it's Haim, the tree of life. That's why, I repeat, Jesus says, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. We are the dead. But we can become living. Now, what are we if we are not living? Here is the other word. The letter Tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, relates to Malkut. The physical body is the, is the only letter that remains with us when we fall into sin. The letter Tav, which means in the ancient Hebrew, the cross. The symbol of the mystery of the cross, of the cross of the two forces, Adam and Eve, through alchemy. That's the door to salvation. That's why Malkuth is written with Tav at the end. <coughs> so, but there is a, another word here, which is written with Tav at the end, and which is Hayot. You see? It's written exactly with the letter, the letter Het, which means the man and the woman united. Then the letter Yod, which is the brain, 
and the letter Vav, which is the spinal medulla, and at the end, the letter Tav, Hayot. And what is Hayot? That means animals, brutes, beasts. And that applies to us. So, Kabbalistically, alchemically speaking, we are not Hayim, we are Hayot. And that Hayot refers to the left, that's go down. That's why when we talk about the left, it relates to the tree of good and evil. The left side that can go up or can go down. It depends on us. Now, the left, as we said, is the Zayin. Is that feminine aspect in us, related to the sexual organ. Because the energy that we utilize for procreation is a sexual energy related with the sexual organ. We can take it down in order to create like the beasts, or up in order to create like the angels. Haim. So that's why in the Bible is written in the book of Zechariah. Before we place before you two paths: the path of life and the path of death. The path of death is klipoth. You can utilize your sexual force of your chava, your eve, your feminine force, your liquid your semen to create like the beasts or to create like the human beings like the angels that's alchemy I don't need to teach you how to create like the beasts because all of us were created like that no matter if we are very religious Jewish people or very religious Muslims people or Christians or, or Tibetans or whatever all of us are created like the beasts. Because in the same way that the beast, the animal, irrational, perform the sexual act, the same way we do it. There's no difference. So we are hayot from the left. <coughs> and that's why, of course, this is the alchemical aspect of these two mysteries. That we had to learn in order to grasp the teachings, the wisdom hidden in Cain and Abel, the two polarities, the Sethians or the Nasenians knew about this. We we're just giving the basic things, but we had to learn that which is inside. Now. You will understand why the word Nahash relates to the serpent. If you remember, Nahash is written with noon in the beginning, then with the letter He in the middle, and the letter Shin at the end. Nahash. We know that the three, the letter Shin, symbolizes the fire. The letter Het is the duality, man and woman. And the letter Nun is the sperm of the ovum. Either way, the letter Nun symbolizes in Aramaic fish. That's what it means, noon, fish. And that's why uh, in the Bible there is a book that is called the book of Joshua. The son of noon. The son of the fish. And that's why Jesus, Joshua in Hebrew, was called the son of the noon, the son of the fish. All of us, of course, are children of the fish. The sperm and the ovum. But not alchemically speaking. We are children of the sperm and the ovum, 
like Hayot. Now we have to learn how to be born from the fish, which is the sperm of the oven, symbol of Christianity, as Chaim, living entities. And that is when you learn how to transmute the sperm in the oven, or how to extract the fire that is in the sperm in the oven, in order to lead your spinal column. That's why, why the word Nahash, which is serpent, begins with N, which is the sperm in the oven, because the serpent begins in the sex. In the sexual organ is the serpent. Why? The serpent is the sexual potency. The serpent itself is that fire that circulates in the blood and that gives us sexual strength or sexual humility to the woman. And of course, is when the ovum is ready to be fecundated, the woman feels that fire. She feels that fire in her sex. And the sexual potency in the man comes from his sperms. Uniting both are the letter Nun. And that's why after the letter Nun you find the letter Het, which is the union of the two polarities, Bav and Zayin. Nah. And the final outcome is the fire, Nahash. You see? In the word, is given the meaning. The fire of your sexual organ rising through the two cords of the caduceus of mercury towards your brain. That is Nahash. So there are two serpents. As you see, the one on the right and the one on the left. Now, the one in the middle is that glory of God that all of us had in the past, but no longer have. Because we perform the sexual act as hayot, as animals. If we learn how to perform the sexual act as humans, then that light in the middle of the caduceus, that marvelous serpent, which is called Harit, the wind serpent of light, will flourish in our throat made word. In Hebrew, you call it Shekinah. <coughs> you see? Begins with Shin, with fire. Shekinah is the glory of God. That is the light that was rising in the spinal medulla of Adam and Eve before the sin of eating the fruit. The fire of Shekinah is what in Hindustan, in India, call it Kundalini. Is what in Mexico they call it Quetzalcoatl. You see many names. The fire of Shekinah is a feminine fire of the Holy Spirit that rises in the spinal column. It gives you the wings of the angels. In other words, the power to penetrate in all the superior sephiroth dimensions that people call heaven. That power acquires in your spirit to penetrate there. When you transmute the fire of Nun to the two polarities and wakes your Nahash, your serpent. But there are three, as you see. One in the right, one in the left, and the other in the middle. The middle is Shekinah. Always fire. <coughs> that light of Shekinah was that light that was given so, uh, uh, that beauty to Adam and Eve. The Sohar states that when that light of Shekinah was shining inside of everybody, 
of that race, Adam and Eve. Adam could not, can, can, couldn't see his wife because so beauty, so beautiful. Because the light of Shekinah was, was shining through her. And also, Adam was very handsome because that light was exuding through his pearls. Because they were made into the image of God. God is fire. Ish. They were Ish and Isha. Adam and Eve. Yot Chava, as we say. Different meanings in Hebrew. But of course, as it is written in the book of Genesis, It is written, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Jodhebarhelohim had made. You see, when you talk about any beast, how do you write beast in Hebrew? Hayot. So the serpent <coughs> was the most subtle than any beast of the field. The field in Hebrew is the asod. When you talk about the field, it refers to the sexual organs. When you said, now the serpent was the most subtle beast of the field, the translation is, now the sexual potency of the man and the woman was a most subtle power in the sexual organ, the field. And now you know how the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. The serpent is written, came to the woman he didn't come to the brain and talk to Adam and I said, Hey, Adam, did God tell you not to eat from the tree of good and evil? No, he didn't talk to Adam. Because Adam is okay. He's a brain, he's spina medulla. The sexual organ is precisely the one that is active when it's separation of sexes. Because when the sexes were united, then Adam and Eve in one body were multiplying without the necessity of the sexual act. Still you find in this day and age certain individuals that are born with the two sexual organs. The ovaries and the testicles inside and they pregnant themselves without the sexual act. Very rare to find those hermaphrodites is called. Do not mistake with the degenerated hom homosexuals of this time. That's, that is another thing. Talking about the true hermaphrodite. They have both sexes inside. And it has no lust inside. Those hermaphrodites were fecundating themselves by themselves. Before the division in sexes. <coughs> but when the sexes were divided. And then the serpent has to work. Because if the man has no erection in his phallus, he cannot penetrate the woman. And if the woman is not humid in the sexual act, how is she going to receive the phallus of the man? So the serpent gives the humility to the woman and the erection to the man. And that subtle force, subtle power, acts through the blood. And that's why the blood is that element that gives you erection or humility in the sexual act. That's why those uh, uh, inventions of these uh, modern science are giving you that uh, pills that I don't remember the name now in order to increase the, the blood and to give erection to the man. And it stays there. If you have uh, heart problems, don't take it. But yeah, it's relation with the blood. Right? But of course, 
give you that in order for them to fornicate more, to become more beasts as they already are. That's, that's the sad thing of the matter. But we know this mystery, and we know how to increase potenti the, the potency in the sexual organ of the man or in the woman without the necessity of artificial things. That's by transmuting the same fire. It's what gives you potency. So now you understand how Adam and Eve were tempted. In other words, the sexual organ of the male and the female tempted the two polarities. It's not like people think, oh, the woman was tempted. No, it is a sexual organ. Because there is where you find that subtle force, which is in the field of Yesod, which is called Shada in Hebrew. Shada is written Shaddai and represented by like the god Pan. You see the god Pan? There are many religions that call it, oh, this is uh, how you call uh, uh, a religion from the, from the forces of nature. Pantheistic. Although other people call it paganism. Paganism is called from Pan, the god Pan, which is the strength of nature. So that in Hebrew, that Pan in Hebrew is called Shaddai, which is translated as the almighty God in the, in the Bible. But really the word Shadda or Shaddai means Mephistopheles, devil, uh, and any type of uh, element that is related with sexual power. Shatan as well. That's the power of Shatan. Or Satan, as you say. Isn't it a sexual organ? So that force, because in the beginning, man and woman were guided by the angels and they were performing the sexual act in order to awake and to strengthen the Shekinah, their own Shekinah, their own divine mother within themselves. The glory of God. But it is written that they were tempted by their own sexual force <coughs> to perform the sexual acts out of the temples. Because at that time, the sexual act was performed only in the temples, never in the house, under the direction of the angels. In order for them not to commit the mistake of to fall into the kingdom of Hayot. Because the plan of the angels were to put this humanity into the kingdom of Chaim, the living. But the serpent was the most subtle power. And it says, I talk to the woman, to the sexual organ. So you cannot eat from the trees of the garden, your body. And then the woman said, No, it is written. God said, don't eat from that fruit. Don't even touch it. The tree. They were touching the tree only in the temples. They were guided in the sexual act. But then they had the occurrence of doing it in their homes. They touch it because the sexual organ is the most sensitive organ of the sense of touch. So the hands really with the sense of touch. But the sexual organ is more sensitive than the hands. And they said, don't touch it, means don't penetrate the woman. Don't receive the man in the sexual act. He says, don't touch it. Because you don't know how to manipulate that energy of the serpent. But the serpent said, no, if you knew and if you discover how to do it, you will know about good and evil. Because the sexual energy related with the left, Zain, can go down to hell. And you can know the depravities of the demons, which is fornication. That's why it's written there that when the woman saw that that fruit was pleasant to the eyes, it's so clear there, it's telling you. 
What is pleasant to your eyes? It's only one word. Whether you see this, whether you see that, what is pleasant to your eyes? It's the light. Without your eyes, you cannot see the light. The light of the glory of God, the Shekinah. So when the woman, or through the sexual organ, we knew that we can acquire intellect, wisdom, through that light, which is called fruit, which is an energy. Because that is the outcome of all the metabolism of our physical body. That's the fruit, is the light. Ish, isha, or the light in Hebrew. So it is written there that when the woman saw that light, or that fruit, and that was good, because really, the glory of God is good. And if you know how to transmute it, and you know how to manipulate that force, that is good for you, for your initiation, for your own development. Because it's written that when God was manipulating that energy by himself, <coughs> he said, let there be light. And the light was good. Let the waters divide from the upper waters, from the inferior waters, and make the firmament in the middle. And God saw that it was good. And separate the dried earth from the water, and God saw that it was good. So this good is made by God. So when that woman... Or when that force, that feminine force of that place saw that light that was good and that you can make the same thing that God did. He stretched his hand or her hand to take that light and only to build that as God knowing good and evil. But instead of transmuting the energy, he says, took the fruit off the tree. In other words, he took the light. They reached the orgasm, the spasm of the animals that they didn't know, that they were not doing it before. And when they reached the spasm and the orgasm, all the fire of that light went out and they became naked. They thought, oh, I will take that glory of God for me and to become God as God. But they couldn't control it. And as a beast, they reached the orgasm and they lost the whole thing because the vase of that is in the, is in the noon, is in the sexual organ. And that's precisely the departure from Eden. Because eating means voluptuousness in the light of God. That was inside. When that humanity fell in the orgasm, a spasm of the beast, all that light went off. They took the light here yeah, for them. But they sent them to clip off to hell. And that light, instead of shining in the spinal column, went down like the beasts and make the tail of Satan in them. That is the birth of Shatan, or Satan, which is written also with sin. You see, this is how you write in Hebrew, Shatan. Shin, Tet, Final Nun. The sheen is a fire that was taken. The tet is a symbol of a serpent in Hebrew. Going down to hell. That is Shatan. This is how Shatan was born. This is why Satan was born inside of us. Before was Lucifer, the giver of light inside of us. 
Lucifer means light and fire, shining. Was a precious angel. But when humanity did that, that light went down and became Satan. So Satan is inside of each one of us. Is the outcome of the orgasm. Since that time, humanity keeps fornicating, reaching the orgasm, the spasm, fortifying Satan. Satan is not an individual that is outside there, as many ignorant people think, that control the world. No, Satan is inside of each one of us. He's a shadow of God, polluted. The shame of degeneration falls into Satan, not in God. But that is the light that we polluted with our actions. Because it's written that God said, you shall not eat from that fruit. Don't even touch it. But we did it. Now we are fallen. Now, that is what the Sethian said. That that light make a nest in us. Which is Cain. That's the first son of Adam and Eve. Cain, the nest, the serpent, fallen. And that's why Cain was a tiller of the ground. He started learning about evil. And since that time, all of us are learning about evil. We don't need to teach you about evil. We know a lot. Now we have to stop and return into the light and being as God is knowing good and evil. But that is not easy because we have to kill Cain. It's the nest in us that can give us wisdom because if we take advantage of that evil that is Cain, the nest, the outcome of that filthiness, because when the sexual organ with Eve saw that light that was pleasant to the eyes, the word pleasant in Hebrew is nahemad. And it's written in Kabbalah that nahemad is the mother of adultery. In other words, we became identified with the lure of the sexual force in the man and the woman. That's Nahema or Nahemad. Listen, when a man is young and his testicles are giving him all that energy in order to be a man, that beauty in the body of that man that is handsome is that Nahemad. And in the woman as well. That is that light. Which is in the spinal column. That is nourishing the cells. And that's why when the men and the woman are young. They are beautiful. They exude that light. Called Nahemad. But we identify with it. As Adam and Eve. When he saw that light that was so pleasant. This is what happened with us. With the ego alive, we identify with that light, with that Nahemad, which is the mother of adultery. So in other words, Cain was born from Nahemad, from adultery. Because what we had to see always is the light of our Divine Mother, the light of Shekinah. We always say that. We have to see the light of Shekinah, the light of our Divine Mother, our first love. She is our first love. To love God above all things. But in the very sexual act, not even in the sexual act, when you see a woman that is very attractive, that's Nahema. Who is not adulterous? Not to adulterate. It means not to pollute that Shekinah inside of us. By coveting the neighbor's wife or by coveting any woman. And if we are a woman, 
by coveting any man. But this society is made in the basis of Nahemad. Everybody that is losing, according to them, their beauty, their evil beauty, they immediately go to the uh, plastic surgery. The surgeon. Can you stretch my face first? Because I am a little bit ugly now. I want to look young. Okay? Because I am, worship, I, I am worshiping Nahemad. That's why we say. <coughs> and the name of the human, human and divine name of Shaddai, which is a sexual force. In the name of the angel Anael, the angel of love. Be gone, Lilith. Let us rest in peace, Nahemah. We want to be in peace with Nahema. That implies meditation. A lot of work in ourselves. In order to know how to transform the energy of the sexual force. Instead of being identified. Like men, for instance. When they see a, a, that force of Nahemad protruding through the body of any woman. They... Take the cloth of that woman with their brain, with their thoughts. They make it naked and even possess them in the sexual act with their mind. That is very common. The first thing that any male sees in a woman is precisely the sexual organ. And the last thing is the face. And that is precisely that cane that we have in the mind. That the custom that we have. We are adulterers by nature. But we like to point others are adulterers. And we said, no, we, I am not adulterers. Everybody is adulterers here. Because from that adultery was born precisely this humanity. That's why Jesus of Nazareth called this humanity this pervert and adulterous generation the man a sign from me, but a sign was given unto them by the sign of the prophet Jonah. As the prophet Jonah was three days and three nights in the well, in the belly of the well, the Son of Man also must be in the belly of the well. Three nights and three days. It's a symbol of alchemy. <coughs> so then, Abel, as we talked in other lecture, is that breath that uh, goes up to the sexual organ and nourishes that, unfortunately, Nahemad in us that we worship. That's why it is written that the children of Nahemad have still an opportunity to repent. If they learn how to transform that force in their body, little by little. When they learn how to see the opposite sex without lust. Because that was first, the, precisely the first problem of Eve. Eve is that hormonal sexual force that we feel as men or a woman. When we are teenagers, when we start feeling that hormonal force from our testicles or ovaries in our body, what is the first thing that we do? Through our eyes, we see the other light of the other opposite sex, and we see that it's very pleasant to our eyes. And we want to take it. But we have to learn how to transmute, how to transform that light into chastity. Unfortunately, in this society, they teach you how to satisfy your Nahemad and even go to Lilith, which is the worst, which is a, a sexual depravity, sexual degeneration. <coughs> That's why it is written that uh, Adam had two wives. You see, Adam has two Ishas, two fires. The brain had two fires inside of us. The fire of Nahemah and the fire of Lilith. 
The fire of Nahema is adultery. Prostitution. And the fire of relief is the most degenerate. It's homosexuality, lesbianism, and all degeneration, violence against nature, sexually speaking. In this society, uh, uh, we applaud, we uh, worship degeneration. When somebody says, oh, I'm coming out of the closet, he serves this applause. Oh, he's a degenerate coming out of the closet. What a courage. Shame on us. But we applaud that. Why? Because we are degenerate. Because we have that inside. Hmm? Adultery is applauded as well. So we have to renounce these two fires. Or as the Kabbalah said, these two wives. And it's not as many people think. That when we go on the streets, we don't have to look at women. Like fanatics. We have to learn how to to see as the women and the women have to learn how to see as the men without profanation without perversity and you don't learn that with fanaticism you learn that when you sit down and meditate and you start inquiring about your own psychology why do I why, why, do, why do I do this what should I have to do <coughs> in order to change but we give the techniques here to meditate, to learn that, in order to change our nature. That's alchemy. It's not like, oh, you need to believe in this, and then automatically the change will come to you. Or you will raise your arm aloft and say, I believe in Jesus, and the transformation will come automatically in you. No, it doesn't happen like that. That Yeshua, which if you see, also had the Shin in the middle. Yeshua in Hebrew means the fire of God within you. You have to awake it. That Yeshua, the Savior, fire of God, is the one that will transform you and will forgive you little by little as you repent in the 49 levels of your mind. That's why <coughs> it is written that when we ate of the fruit, it's written that uh, the first one that was called was Adam. God was in the Garden of Eden looking for Adam. Where are you? This is what is written there, right? But if you know alchemy, the translation will be this. Where is your Shekinah? I don't see it. What have you done? Oh, I am naked. I don't have it anymore. How do you know that you don't have the, the, my glory in you? I guess that you ate from the tree that I told you don't to eat. Well, the sexual organ that you gave me, gave it to me, said the brain. And I ate and then goes to the sexual organ, Eve. What have you done? Well, you know, I am the sexual organ here and I have a lot of energy. I had to feed the brain, I know. But the sexual potency, the serpent, beguiled me. Oh. And then he goes into the serpent. What have you done? Since you have done this, now you are cursed. Among the beasts of the field. Yes, I. Now, which serpent is cursed there? The one that fornicated. What serpent fornicated? Zain. The left side of the Caduceus of Mercury. That the serpent that fornicates. Because the right one is Tov. Is Val. The one that goes into, towards the brain. But it's good. But the other one is evil. That was the one that fornicated. That is what is curse in other words 
fornication, orgasm, spasm is cursed. Because from it comes the tail of Satan. That serpent, instead of going up like the angels, go down into hell like the demons. And forming the tail of Satan. All of us have that tail. And that is the serpent that is cursed. It's not Lucifer, as many think, are his curse. The serpent, Lucifer, no. It's that serpent in each one of us. That's why we are cursed. Because we are fornicators. <coughs> each one of us. And this says, on your belly you are going to go. And dirt you will eat all the days of your life. And this is sending, of course, the fire that was after or before that was nourishing the tree of life is now now going down, nourishing the tree of death. And this is how humanity knew death. And that's why that serpent is cursed. That is what is called in esotericism the kunda buffer organ, the tail of Satan related to the left side. The demons have the right side of their bodies nourishing the brain and their intellect. And with the left serpent, they fornicate. The angels, they have the two serpents standing like the caduceus of Mercury. And the light of Shekinah within them. The light of God within them. But we don't have the light of God within us. Because the left serpent is fallen. Is uh, riding in the mud of the earth. And that's why it is the sexual organ. In this case, the sexual organ of the woman. Says, now you will give birth with pain. Because you are fecundating your children with pleasure like animal. And that's why the serpent is a statement that says to the serpent, when he's cursed, you're cursed above all hayot. And above all Haya. Do you understand that? The serpent is cursed above all Hayot and above all Haya. Hayot and Haya, related to Yesod, to the sex. Why? What is this above? Well, the irrational animal called bull, horse, dog, cat, all of those Hayot. They fornicate. Look at them. When they perform the sexual act, they spill the, the semen. They reach the orgasm like any animal because they are instinctual. But they are not to blame because they don't have intellect. So God doesn't punish them. And they obey the, the forces of nature and they live happily in the, in the forest, in the field. Unless uh, the human or the human oil goes and kills them. That's another thing. But they live in Eden, still living in that happiness. <coughs> hmm? Those are those hayot, those ha hai. But who are above those hayot? Aren't we above them? According to evolution, we come from the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and human kingdom. We are above them. But we are cursed. Above the animals. But we feel that we are superior, of course. As we said, we are the killers of nature, not the kings of nature. We kill the animals, we destroy the whole nature. But we are cursed. Above them. Even though any bird, any cat, any lion that kills for hunger is more innocent than us. So this is how that serpent was cursed above every hayot of the field of the sexual organ. Because the hayot, the irrational hayot, they fornicate. But they are not to blame. We have the intellect. We know about good and evil. So we are to blame. Because only to the intellectual hayot is stated that said, from the fruit that is in the center of your body, 
of good and evil, you shall not eat. Because the day that you, sh you shall eat from it, you will die. So you see how everything is hidden there, alchemically speaking? When people look for a serpent, they curse <coughs> some devil outside that is cursed because he induced a couple that were happily living in a garden. According to them, this is how they interpret, that in the beginning God made a beautiful couple. And the couple went and ate from the fruit that was in the tree of, in the middle. And that the serpent appears there and said, I eat from this fruit. They disobey and that's why they are cursed. The serpent is cursed. Literally speaking, but symbolically speaking, that is inside of us. We are that. That Cain is that nest that we have. And that's why the Cainites, Cainites are they called, another Gnostic sect that was destroyed in the Middle Ages by the Inquisition. They, was, they were burned alive because they were teaching these mysteries. We're teaching that Cain is a nest in us, called the Cainites. Of course, the Cainites, no, a Cain, Canaanites, the Canaanites. Well, this is how it's called, the Canaanites, related to Cain, of course. They were learning and teaching how, uh, because of the fallen sin, we build that nest, that filthiness in us. And they were teaching that by annihilating that nest, by destroying that evilness that we made in the past, we build wisdom. Mm -hmm. Because when you take that wisdom out and you learn how you do it, you don't easily fall again. Because you know about good and evil. If you talk to a child and say, put your finger in that fire, you will feel a pleasant sensation. The child will go and put it there and get burned. It will feel pain. And if you come the second time and you say to the child, do it, you will feel pleasant. The child won't do that. He already have experience in the flesh that is painful. The same with us. We know a lot of evil. Now we have to learn how to go out from that evil by meditation, by comprehension, by analysis, and to annihilate that. The wisdom will remain in us. Then we will know good and evil. But just if you learn, if we learn how. And that's precisely the work of Habel. We had to resuscitate Habel, that breath that we need to feed, which is the soul, because Abel represents the budata, the soul, the embryo of soul that we need to uh, nourished. And Cain passed for a transformation too that we talk in other lectures. First Cain and then Tuval Cain and then Cainan at the end. Cainan is the outcome of good and evil. The son of Seth and Enosh. I don't want to talk about that because if you want to know you, can, you have to listen to the other four lectures. Remember that this is the fifth. So suppose that you listen to the other four, you more or less know what I'm talking about. Do you have questions? <coughs> yeah? Okay, the translation, yeah. The question is, in other lectures we said Cain is the mind. And now I'm seeing the nest. Well, Cain, the translation of the word, literally means nest. But of course, that nest is from where we take in order to feed our brain. All the evilness that we know in our minds come from it. Remember that it is called that the original sin. <coughs> what is the original sin? 
is fornication. When we created that nest. And through evolution, that became the development of the intellect or the mind in the evil way that we, we have it. That we utilize the mind only for evil. So that's a, an, the evolution of Cain. So the, that knowledge, that's why when we talk about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we always say the root of the tree of good and evil is in Yesod. And the top of the tree of good and evil is in the head. It's called Da'at. So here is the foundation and here is the top of the tree. So the outcome of what we do sexually is the type of mind that we are going to have. So the mind that we have right now is Cain. Related with evil. Completely. Because Cain killed Abel. Which was the only good thing that we had in the past. But Abel is now dead in us. Which is the soul. We don't. There are some people that don't even believe in the soul. Not even in the spirit. They said the mind is everything. Cain in other words. They are worshipping of, worships of Cain. So therefore, the mind is Cain. And if we work with, it, with alchemy, we will transform that mind into Cainan. Which will be a mind that knows good and evil. But that is a long process. Because the serpent told us that we will become like gods. Like gods. Knowing that we are going to be gods. Like gods. Because the gods know good and evil. <coughs> so when we resuscitate from all of this work. Then we become like them. Knowing good and evil. Hmm? And of course this is a process of transformation. That is called alchemy. And uh, we take that, as I said. That wisdom from Cain. Which is very alive. And that wisdom will flourish in your brain, in your Adam. What was the translation for Seth? <coughs> Seth. <coughs> well, Seth symbolizes. It's written with Shin and Tap. Uh, right now, I don't remember. Maybe uh, somebody will refresh my mind. Because many Greek words, Hebrew words, floating in my mind. But Seth, I know that it's always written with Shin and Tav. And uh, uh, that is uh, uh, the two last letters of the Hebrew alphabet that we work with, with the fire and with the cross. Uh, The Sethians, of course, are in relation with the fire. The third son of Adam and Eve. Do you have another question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what is the meaning of the three days alchemically in the stone of Jonah? The three days? The question is, what are the three days in the uh, alchemical work of Jonah? The book of Jonah. Well, that reminds me, uh, the Wizard of Oz, you know, in Hebrew, <coughs> tree is Otz. But if you put between these two letters, which is Ajin and Zare, the letter Vav, and then you write Oz, which is also the land of Uz. Which is the spinal column. Because the bar is the spinal column. So the tree of life is the land of Uz. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. The same as Jonah. The one that knows this mystery 
the one that know this arcana and start working in themselves, they enter into the belly of the whale. That whale represents the planet Earth. The center is a nice sphere or the center of your own body because you center, you enter into the very center, which is your soul, your sexual organ, to work with Lucifer, or better said, to work with Shatan. Shatan. This Shatan, of course, is the one that pulled the, the ordeals in the path. It is written that when we want to transform ourselves, we need to work with three days in the ninth sphere. The ninth sphere is Lucifer. Dante found Lucifer in the ninth sphere. So the three days are three alchemical works that we, ha we have to perform in the land of Uz to become perfect. The first day is the creation of Hayot HaKadosh, the holy crucified bodies, the holy creatures inside of us. The astral body, the mental body, the causal body, and the physical body. Hayot HaKadosh. That's the first day. The second day is to uh, achieve the incarnation of the spirit. Because in the first day, you incarnate your soul. You become a human soul, a human being. So after that first day, you work in the elaboration of the incarnation of the spirit. That's the second day. <coughs> Which comes after you incarnate your human soul, you have to incarnate your spirit in your divine soul. The third day is a resurrection. When your divine mother Shekinah shines again in all your bodies and you return into Eden, the fourth dimension, it's called resurrection. Remember that that Shekinah was shining in the beginning, but because we fell, that light didn't shine anymore. But the third day of the, of the book of Jonah is precisely that, when he resurrects and the light of Shekinah is shining again in the body. Those are three alchemical steps or stages that we have to perform. Those are the three days that Jesus says, the only sign that we will give is this. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, likewise, the Son of Man will be three nights and three days in the center of the earth. And hell, in other words. Because we have to descend in order to transform ourselves. But of course, before the resurrection, is what precisely comes in that story that we place in the website. The story of Job. Job says, was a perfect man. I fear God. In the land of Uz. That land is a spinal column. Anybody that enters into these mysteries of alchemy and works with the two fires that we explain here, enters into the land of Uz and work. And have seven children, or seven sons, the seven sephiroth, and three daughters, three souls, which are called Nefesh, Neshama, and Ruach, <coughs> in alchemy. And then uh, it is written there in the book of Job that one day when that initiate reached that level, that day came the children of God before Jehovah. And Jehovah saw the children of God coming to him and among them was coming Satan. And you wonder, who is this Satan? Satan is precisely the sexual force. And then Jehovah asked to Satan, uh, How do you see my servant Job? The translation should be like this How do you see 
Obd, the left serpent <coughs> of the Caduceus of Mercury in the physical body of that soul that fears me. Isn't that good? Because that serpent is, rose, is rising again and is not doing evil. And then the Shatan, which is precisely the sexual force, fell, related with that left serpent, says, well, Jove is uh, fearing you for nothing because you have given him a lot for his alchemical work. But uh, I tell you, if you allow me, I will take everything that he has. And you will see how he will blaspheme in your very face. Because that is, that's a work that happens at the very end, in the third day, in the land of Uz, in the spinal column. And then Jehovah said to Satan, okay, go down to the earth, go down to the physical body of, of that soul of mine, and do what you want, but don't touch his body. And of course, Satan, or in this case, is very clear now, very clean, is going to tempt Job. But Job already know about good and evil. Because he's rising. And that happens with anybody that enters into this path. Your inner God, <coughs> in order to know how are you doing this? You, you might wonder, I have these months or these years doing this alchemy, sexual transmutation and all this work. I wonder, in which level am I? And then the, that prayer goes to God. And God called Satan and said, Hey, is he really uh, uh, pure? He really doing something good? How do you know? Where you come from? Satan said, well, I'm coming from going up and down, up and down in his physical body. Down before when he was fornicating. Now he is transmuting. So, of course, he's helping me. He's, I'm going up. But, you know, sometimes he has uh, uh, wet prints and I'm going down there. And then he meditates and I'm going up again. Back and forth, back and forth. Oh, I said, but uh, how do you... See? What opinion do you have of that soul? Well, you want me to test him? To tempt him? Okay, okay. It's in your hand. Do it. Because I want a soul with a willpower, not a weak one. And this is how Satan comes down and tempts you. And a very sexual act. I remember the case of a couple that I met many years ago. Satan came down, of course, but didn't uh, work the mind of that initiate, but the mind of his wife. And his wife was telling him, too many years doing this transmutation, and look, I have no children. I need a child. You know, I cannot fornicate. I am an initiate. And she was every day repeating the same song, even with music. So finally, the man says, oh, what the heck? For well, one time, I will pregnant her and I will stop listening to this daily lecture. So that night, he fell on purpose. He fornicated. He reached the orgasm and fell into temptation. He lost everything. And then he called me and said, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but this is what happened to me. Now I am going up again. Because Shatan tempted my wife and I fell because of her. And what happened? Well, I have a beautiful daughter with her, you know, but I lost everything. So that was the outcome. You see? So Satan always, always comes. And if you have children, oh, he will tempt you in other ways. Because he has many ways to tempt you when you are in the path. 
But if you defeat him, and then he gives you power, because he has power in, in heaven and in hell. You become a resurrected. You become a dragon, as the master says. In the land of Uz. Yeah? Question? It might. Romulus, uh, Romulus and Ramus, the founders of the, of the city of Rome. It might. It might be similar because this, this myth that we are talking here, Cain and Abel, is not a, a particular uh, uh, archetype that belongs only to the Jews. I teach about this because we are Christians. Jews and Muslims know about this, but they don't know the meaning of it. They know the story. But this myth was written also in Greek mythology in other ways, of course. Coming into my mind now, the story of Hunapu and Ishbalanke in the Popol Vuh, the, the Mayan Bible, the same meaning. Hunapu and Ishbalanke, and this is more beautiful, this is more alchemical there, if you read the story in the Popol Vuh, the Mayan Bible. It's related with the same mystery of Cain and Abel. The two polarities that we have, the two serpents. <coughs> so as you see, uh, because we don't have God, the glory of God within, what do we have instead? What do we have instead? You know what? We have Satan, his shadow. And that shadow knows very well how do we behave. He knows very well your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. You want to return to your inner God? Let me tell you, Satan will tempt you. Will give you a lot of temptations in order for you to develop virtues. If you defeat him in all temptations, then you will come another archangel with light, knowing good and evil. But Satan is under the service of your own particular individual God. And when you want something, a favor from your God, he always sends Satan and brings Satan. He says, how do you see this guy or well, this woman? He's asking me for this. Does he deserve it? Satan will say, no. Let me tell you what he did yesterday. Or what she did one week ago. Oh, I said, okay. So God knows everything evil that we do because Satan informs him every second of everything that we do. And we have it inside. Inside of our psyche and our body. When we go to the sexual act, it gives you sexual strength. You have to defeat it. Yeah, your question? Well, the elixir of love life is a, a substance of light and fire related with the vital body that is given to those that succeed the three days. If you defeat the dragon, if you defeat Satan and all temptations, you will receive at the end the elixir of long life. Then you will enter into Eden again, an immortal being. But first you have to defeat Satan in sex. Because life is in the sexual force. The elixir of long life has a sexual basis. If you perform the sexual act like a hayot, like a beast, you know death as it is written. The day that you eat from that fruit, you will die. And we die because of that. You, we had to be immortal again? Okay, so we had to defeat Satan in order for us to enter into the tree of life again. Otz Chaim is what happened to Job. He was in the land of Uz. But the wizard of Oz, his own Satan, was tempting him, testing him. Do you, you got that? The creator of that story, the wizard of Oz, is, uh, I heard it was a, a Rosicrucian. He knew about this. He made that, and people liked that, right?
the two witches and all that, well, related to the tree of life, a chemical story that you read and you tell to your children, but you don't know the meaning. As many read the Bible and the story, the myth of Adam and Eve, and they don't know the meaning of it. <coughs> Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,